Well, now that we've looked at the thermodynamic processes uh, that are involved in an engine operation, let's look a little bit at the combustion process. So we're actually going to look at the fuel and what's happening to that fuel inside the engine cylinder. And yes, we're going to do a little bit of chemistry. You see an equation up here, so uh, don't worry. I'm a lot older than you, and I'm further from my chemistry class than you are. Uh, so you guys will be better at this than I will be, for sure. But we need to understand what's going on, because a lot of this has implications to our emissions and things that are the other things that are going on with the engine that we need to be concerned about as engineers and designers. So we're going to look at the combustion theory process and then we're ultimately going to look at the air fuel ratio. So how much air that I have to put with fuel uh, to, to make it burn, uh, to make it burn properly. And so we'll, we'll do an example there of that. So let's look at a couple facts and let me lay these things out and we're gonna come back here and work on this equation and uh, focus on that. Uh, but there's a couple things here that we need to understand. The oxidation process is basically, that's what the fuel burning is. It's an oxidation, so the fuel oxidizes. The same kind of process that happens with metal rusting. So it's basically the combination of fuel and oxygen, but really what this means is it's fuel plus air. And we know that air is not just oxygen, air has a whole lot of nitrogen in it. And so the nitrogen that we have to bring into the engine is what causes us trouble. Uh, by the way, another fact that we need to understand that we're going to use is that we look at the composition of air. Air is mostly nitrogen and oxygen. And so the ratio of nitrogen to oxygen is about 3.76 molecules of N2 for every oxygen molecule. So that's the concentration of oxygen, uh, or, or the relative concentration of oxygen and nitrogen. Um, the other gases in the air, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, everything else, are, are just a fraction of a percent. And so in most of our analyses, we ignore those uh, as we go through there. All right, so, so that's what we need to know. So we're gonna get fuel and oxygen. If everything works out great, we're gonna end up with carbon dioxide and water out. So that's what we should have, those two products. But we'll see that, hey, there's, we know we're gonna get some, some uh, nitrous uh, NOxes and some other things happening, and we'll talk about why that happens. All right, some other facts we need to keep in the back of our head, molecular weights. You guys can probably rattle these off the top of your head, but hydrogen's one, carbon 12, nitrogen 14, oxygen 16, and we'll use those. And we're gonna be going after eventually the air fuel ratio. So if I've got an engine that has so much fuel going into it and the application might be, hey, I've got to put an air filter on the front of this engine. How big does that air filter have to be? How much air is it going to have to accommodate? So how much air do I got to put with that fuel to get it out? And then we'll talk about an equivalence ratio. And the equivalence ratio is, is going to be the, uh, <clears throat> the, the how lean or rich the fuel mixture is. And so we'll come back to that and, and define that and talk about what that equivalence ratio is. All right. So let's go back to our equation and look at our equation and go from there. So here's our equation. And this is a combustion equation started to put it together. The first element you see on the left hand side there, C16H34. So in this example we're going to do, that's diesel fuel. So that's the, the basic composition of what a diesel fuel molecule would be. 16 carbon atoms, 34 hydrogens, they're in a chain, you can draw them out, you know, in, a, in different chains and all that kind of cool stuff. I'm not going to do that. We're going to combine that with oxygen. At the same time, because we're bringing oxygen in the engine, there's going to be some nitrogen in that engine as well. So what are we going to get out of it? If it's a perfect combustion, hopefully that nitrogen comes right through. We're going to have some carbon dioxide that's going to burn off of it, and we're going to have water. So those are going to be the two products. So let's balance this equation. Can we do that? Uh, so what do we got over here on the left-hand side? We know we got to start with diesel fuel, and we've got 16 molecules of carbon in there so look on the right hand side where do I have carbon the only place I have carbon showing up is in the CO2 so I'm going to have to have 16 molecules of CO2 to make that equation balance okay so what else do I have over here I have the hydrogen on the left hand side the hydrogen is all going into water so that's the only thing that's going to be over here so H2 
34 hydrogens on the left, so I'm going to need 17, half that many, so I'm going to need 17 water molecules to get the 34 hydrogens. So that makes the carbon and the hydrogen balance out. Now, how many oxygens do I have on the right-hand side so I know how many oxygen molecules I need to go in? So I have uh, 32 here, 2 times 16, uh, plus another 17, so that's 49. So 49, I'm going to need 24 and a half. 24.5 oxygen molecules, okay? So that will make the oxygen balance out. Now, I'm gonna have to have some nitrogen to go along with that. What did I tell you about nitrogen? So the nitrogen molecules are gonna be 3.76 times the number of O2 molecules. So that's 3.76 times 24.5 and that's going to be 92.12 according to my notes if we work that out. So I'm going to need 92.12 molecules of nitrogen to balance that out. Hopefully in an ideal world that's going to come straight out of the engine as nitrogen 92.12 molecules of nitrogen. So that should be the equation, uh, the combustion equation, if it works out for diesel fuel. And we could use some different kinds of fuel, any kind of fuel there, and we're going to have different amounts of oxygen that we need to make that work to get our carbon dioxide and the hydrogen coming out. Now, we know that the real world, it doesn't work like this. <clears throat> so what's going to happen is we know that in, in the presence of heat, nitrogen will like to combine with oxygen. And inside the engine, obviously, we have a lot of heat. And so those nitrogen is going to combine with oxygen. And we're going to end up with, over here, some of this nitrogen and oxygen being combined into some noxious, NOxes. So nitrous oxide, nitric oxide, whatever. So NO1, NO2, NO3, different types of compounds of nitric oxide. Those are the bad things that we really, really, really don't want <clears throat> in our output. Now, if I've got some of the oxygen that's combining with the nitrogen, where was that coming from? It's either coming from the water or it's coming from the carbon dioxide. Most of it is probably going to come from the carbon dioxide. And so what is going to happen, I'm going to end up with a lot of carbon monoxide because some of this oxygen is going to go uh, affiliate, uh, affiliate with the nitrogens and I'm going to end up with carbon monoxides out here. And uh, so I can end up with a lot of different kinds of gases. So, you know, <clears throat> do I put a little extra oxygen in there so I don't end up with carbon monoxide? Then I get more nitrous oxides. Now you start to see what engineers struggle with to try to figure out how to get this to burn because we're never going to get this ideal equation. We're always going to have some other stuff coming out of it. <clears throat> Either some noxes, we're going to have some carbon monoxide. All those things are bad, okay? So that's where we got to work on. Um, that's where engin engineers spend a lot of time trying to figure all that kind of stuff out. All right, so that's the combustion equation and how you do that. And again, you guys can do that um, for a lot of different kinds of, of fuels and so forth. Um, but let's look at now what, I, what I'd really like to, to understand is the air-fuel ratio. And again, the example that I talked about was um, if I'm building an engine, let's say I'm putting an engine in installation, and I need to put an air filter with it, and I need to know how much uh, oxygen, how much air that I've got to be able to get into that engine for it to operate properly. So let's figure this out. We can do that from this combustion equation in here, figure out what it needs to do. So I need to come up with the weight, and this is going to be on a mass basis, so I need to do the, the ratio of the amount of air that goes into that engine to the amount of fuel that goes into the engine. Okay, break it down up here. This is my fuel. This part here is my air, the oxygen and nitrogen. So this is the air and this is the fuel. Okay, again, we're ignoring uh, the other trace gases, which are only a fraction of a percent and are not really going to affect this uh, very much, the carbon dioxides and other things that are in our air. Okay, so mass basis, how do we get the amount of air? Well, now we've got to start looking at what you see over there, the, the atomic weights of these things, and see what's going on in there. So air is what? Air is 24 and a half oxygen. So I have 24.5. Oxygen is 16. 
and it's O2, so I need to have a factor of two in there because there's two molecules. So 24 and a half times 16 times two, that's the oxygen part of the air that goes into that. What's the nitrogen? Add to that, plus 92.12 times nitrogen, which from the, from the slide over there, nitrogen is 14. And there's two of those, it's an N2, so I gotta put the two on there as well. That's the air. Now, underneath that, what is the fuel weight? Do the same thing, look at the fuel, it's a C16, so I have 16 carbons. So 16 times carbon is 12. And I add to that the hydrogen, so I have 34, hydrogen is molecular weight of one. I'll put that in there so we don't just ignore it. We know that the equation is complete. And if I run that through the equation, that gives me a air fuel ratio of 14.9. Okay, so that tells me that on a mass basis, and again, that's the key, that this is on a mass basis. On a mass basis, I gotta have 14.9 kilograms, if you will, of air for every kilogram of fuel that goes into that engine for it to burn correctly and efficiently. And again, that assumes the perfect combustion, okay? So that's how we would calculate that. So I can take an engine now and say, hey, if I had an engine, um, let's, let's think about that example. So for instance, let's go back. How much air would I need on that engine that we just worked with in the last module? We talked about the 7220 tractor, that it had a little over six gallons per minute of fuel that it was burning at, at 72 kilowatts was the output from that. Um, so for that particular thing, the amount of air that I need is gonna be 14.9 times the weight of fuel, the mass basis of fuel that's going into that engine. <clears throat> so area time, the 14.9 times the air, okay, or times the fuel. So the fuel, 14.9, and if I do some conversions, and you can go back and figure this out, remember we had 6.8 gallons, uh, or, or like 6.2 gallons per hour, and, and the density and all that kind of stuff. If you work that out, that comes out to be about 19.5 kilograms per hour of fuel. So that's how much fuel that would need to go into that engine. And usually when we're talking air, we talk about kilograms per minute or something like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and convert this to minutes so that it gets into a, to a units that I typically use. So one hour for every 60 minutes. The hours cancel off. And that tells me, if you put that in your equation, that I need 4.9 kilograms per minute of air. So now I know as a designer, hey, if I'm going to build an engine or put an engine in installation, I've got to put an air filter on the front of it. It's in a dusty environment. That air filter has got to be capable of handling at least 4.9 kilograms per minute, probably a little bit more just to be on the safe side. You know, as designers, we'll build in a factor of safety. So that's what we would work with there. So that's how we can come up with some examples there. Again, remember to do this on a mass basis, not on a volume basis, and don't miss mix mass and, and volume units in when you're doing these equations to come up with air flow rate. That's a common mistake that a lot of people will make. Okay, now one more thing I wanna look at, and on the slide over there you have this equivalence ratio. So I'm gonna define that for you because we don't always run this at the stoichiometric ratio, okay? So this 14.9, the air-fuel ratio that we calculate as 14.9, that's the stoichiometric ratio, which means, hey, if everything is working perfectly and it follows this stoichiometric equation, that's how much, that's what the ratio should be of air to fuel. But we don't always do that. So we define this equivalence ratio, and that's the air to fuel ratio Stoichiometric, we put that in the numerator, CH. So we put the stoichiometric ratio in the numerator. In the denominator, we put what we actually run, so the air to fuel ratio actually. 
all right? So we may put a little bit more air into it than what we theoretically should have to put. If we put more air, air into it, that would say that we're running that engine lean, okay? Which means more air than fuel. So the leaner the engine, the more air that we have in the ratio. The richer the engine, the more fuel we have, the less air, okay? So defining that here, so if, that, if the air to fuel ratio goes, is greater than one, we say that's a rich mixture. Or as it gets bigger, that's a richer mixer, mixture. And if it's less than one, we say it's a lean mixture. And we'll run different engines different ways. So for instance, uh, the compression ignition engines, typically we run them less than one. Uh, so we run them a little bit lean, so we, we, uh, uh, we have uh, a little bit more air into there. What that does is keep some of the temperatures down. If we run it stoichiometric, the temperatures can get high. So we can control the temperature a little bit. We can control the combustion process by how much we put in there. We control how much power we get out of it. So that's the stoichiometric ratio. Now one thing I want you to think about as we, we look at this, um, so this is diesel fuel. Go back up to this equation, C16H34, carbon and hydrogen, that's all that's in that fuel. Now when we start talking about biofuels, and there's a lot of interest now, and it's kind of waned a little bit when the sense of fuel prices have come down, but there's still a lot of work and a lot of people doing some, a lot of things with biofuels. And biofuels, what they're going to do is add oxygen. So if you look at the chemical structure of most biofuels, whether it's a biodiesel, whether it's an ethanol coming from corn or so forth, you can take whatever the base fuel is, so diesel or oxygen or, or uh, gasoline, the chemical formulas for those, and you're going to add some oxygens to them. So it's going to be like C16H34O maybe 6 or something like that, or some amount of oxygen in the fuel. All right, and we talk about these being oxygenates, so that's actually a good thing for fuel. Now, why is that a good thing for fuel? So what's that going to do to this stoichiometric equation? If I have some oxygen already in the fuel, I'm not going to need as much air with that fuel, which means if I don't need as much air, I don't need as many oxygens here, that means I'm not going to be putting as much nitrogen into the cylinder, so I'm going to have less opportunity for, for creation of some of these other compounds here, so for the, the spe specifically the nitrous oxides. So that's one of the good things about that. The other thing, if you think about it practically and mechanically in the cylinder, one of the challenges we have, especially with compression ignition engines, when we compress that fuel and we inject that fuel into the engine, that we want to get a complete mixture before it starts to burn. If that stuff starts to burn a little bit too early, and then it may not get all that fuel mixed with the, with the oxygen. The oxygen molecules won't get distributed. So some of the fuel on the far side of the cylinder, for example, may not have access to the oxygen, may not be able to burn completely. And so by having the oxygen actually as part of the fuel molecule, when the temperatures get high and it starts to volatilize, the oxygen is right there for it to, to, to take part in this reaction and we can get a more complete reaction. So that's that's chemically why oxygenated fuels, why a lot of the biofuels are really advantage to us in terms of, uh, of um, cleaner burning engines and so forth. And so that's the, uh, um, that, that's the motivation, the impetus for all that kind of stuff. So we've kind of introduced that a little bit. We looked at chemical reaction. We see how to calculate all this stuff, looking at our our ratios, air to fuel ratios, and so forth, how much air we need to put with the fuel. The next thing I want to do is go back to the fuels, and we're going to look at the fuels in a little bit more detail. Um, what uh, what is, is in the fuel, what are the different properties that are critical for us? And so keep this in your mind as we move through that to understand how these reactions are working and how that fuel is all going to play into it.